what we've done here today is we've made a Foursquare check-in uh, for you guys to notify your friends. Uh, you can let check in via Facebook on the actual event itself. Um, we can only recommend you to use uh, hashtags VentureCop, Shell, CBS, because those are the three main partners behind this event. The reason that we're here is actually very much shown in this video. It's entrepreneurship. We want to inspire all of you. We know that you have some excellent and great ideas. We heard about some of them. We'd like to hear more. Um, there's plenty of VentureCop staff here today. They have small name tags just like me, so go over, ask, tell them about your idea. We'd be more than happy to help you guys. So in order to welcome you uh, properly, we have Mikkel Trum from Shell. Please come join me. Thanks. Good morning. Is it on? I'm very pleased here on behalf of VentureCop and on behalf of Shell to welcome you to this great event with Saya Gassi. Um, we have actually known it for a while. Uh, we need to collaborate. When we see VentureCop's great winning teams, when we see what happens in the classroom when we work together, And there is kind of two main reasons behind it. The one thing is that innovation happens between the fingers. We have the disciplines. And when you cross disciplines, interesting things happen. Innovation is created between the main disciplines. The other thing is that we need to mix our competences. We need to dare and have the guts and the desire to explore our knowledge, but also our non-knowledge, to go there where we don't have knowledge. And now imagine that our teachers, our researchers, our private and public companies, national and international, are much better in col collaborating. That's our vision in Shell, a new alliance between Copenhagen University, the Technical University and CBS. We can do nothing alone, but we can do a lot together with you, with VentureCup, and um, about creating a vision and standing for it and creating a great product, I think we have probably one of the best examples in the world today here. A lot of new product is created all the time with a rapid speed and it has never gone so fast, but very few new products or ideas take into account the biggest challenge of society today, the environment. To create something great as a product, but at the same time, taking that into account. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome Saya Gassi here on the stage. Will you please come up? <laughs> Give him a hand. And welcome very much to Saya Gassi. Thanks. It's great to be here. Monday morning for me too. Um, unlike you, I had to fly to get here. Um, we'll talk. They told me after 20 minutes they're going to cut my microphone, so I'm going to try and stay brief. Uh, I'm known to go for long, long, long presentations, and I'll try and stay brief and focused on um, what you came here to learn about, which is how to make your idea successful, not my idea. Um, and so I'll give you one lesson that I've learned early on in, uh, in Silicon Valley. I moved to Silicon Valley back in 1995. And, uh, and this, this week is, is sort of a tough week for me because I, I actually moved to Silicon Valley to uh, come work for Apple. And, um, and Jobs wasn't there. 
and I brought in eight of my engineers and we, we sort of set shop one floor below where he worked f for the decade after. And, uh, and I got kicked out of Apple about a year later uh, with my entire team. Because we worked on this, uh, on this technology which nobody at Apple believed in uh, and nobody at Apple thought it would be successful in the years coming. Um, and uh, you, you might have heard about it. It's called Internet Browsers. Um, and everybody at Apple said that's just not, it's just not neat to type these letters. It feels like DOS. And so it's not going to work. <laughs> um, and when I got out, a friend told me this lesson. I'll, I'll share it with you and take, take from it whatever you can take, which is how to be successful in Silicon Valley. It's, a, it's, it's actually uh, a fairly easy three-step program on how to be successful and rich in Silicon Valley. So if there's any time to take notes, this is the time. First stage, come up with a great idea. Write it down. Make sure you have a great plan written down. Then go to Sand Hill Road. If you don't know what Sand Hill Road is, it's where all the venture capitalists sit. Shake a tree. Shake it vigorously. Shake it until a venture capitalist falls down. Show him your plan. Take $5 million. <laughs> That's stage one, believe it or not. Stage two is the hardest. You go and execute your plan. You execute and execute and scale and execute and you grow a company based on that plan. And you change the plan and you execute and you change as the reality around you reflects upon your plan. And as you execute the plan, you grow it. Sooner or later, you're going to take your company public. After you take it public, you grow it even more. And you grow it even more. Until one day, it's a game-changing company. Stage three, sell your shares. Go climb a tree in Sand Hill Road. <laughs> I know it sounds like a joke, but it is a blueprint for success. But let's look at each one of the stages and analyze what you need to do in order to make your reality map to success. Come up with a great idea. How do I come up with a great idea? You see, I got a secret for you. For every one of you, there is a question out there in the universe. That question is looking for you. I don't know what to do with this microphone. Yeah, like that? Is that better? Super. It's awkward. I got to tell you, it's in my vision. And um, there is a cross between uh, three parts in what makes a great company, but also is a a cross between three parts of what makes a great entrepreneur, an individual. Jim Collins, great author from Stanford University, has actually analyzed the most successful companies in the world and found out that of all the successful companies, only 11 companies have been truly greatly successful for a long period of time. And in the cross of these 11 companies, the, the tr true great companies, there's always the presence of three things. First is passion. If you're not doing something that's burning in your, in your gut, you can't do it for a long time. Even if you think it will be something that will be successful, and even if your parents told you it's something that is good for you, even if it's something you stumbled upon and you think you're, you're, you're great at it, if you're not passionate about it, you will wake up one day and say, I can't do it anymore. It'll be an random Tuesday afternoon will say I'm going out of this place and I'm not coming back again. So the first thing you have to find out is what are you passionate about? Don't go do a clean tech company if you're not passionate about saving the world. Do not go out and build another social networking company if you're not passionate about being social. Or as Mark Zuckerberg showed, if you're not passionate about getting dates. You have to be passionate about what you do, and it has to burn inside you. And that's the first thing you've got to find. 
Second thing is go find out what are you the best in the world at. Not what you're good at. Not what you think you're good at. Not what you would like to be good at. Not not what you're sort of okay or better than the average. What you're the best in the world at. And if you can't find something you're the best in the world at, reduce your, your scope. If you're not the best windmill producer, you may be the best rooftop windmill producer. If you're not the best rooftop windmill producer, you may be the best vertical or horizontal windmill producer. And if you're not the best, and I'm giving a pitch for one of the guys, you may find out that you're the best horizontal windmill producer in Copenhagen. But you're still the best in doing that where you are right now. Narrow your scope and find out if you can be the best in the world at something. Because if not, you may be very passionate and you may be working really hard, but you're never going to be competitive. And that drives people crazy because you're really putting everything you got. And you're passionate, you're just not good at it. The third element is forgotten by a lot of people. Figure out what your economic engine is. What drives the machine that pays the bills? Because you may be a great pianist, and you may be very, very passionate about it. You may even be the best pianist in Copenhagen. They just don't pay piano players. And so sooner or later, you'll find out that you're doing piano from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning. But you got to do something else to pay the bills. And then before you know it, you get a bit too tired and you start doing the piano from 10 p.m. And then before you know it, it's only on Tuesdays. And then you stop. Whereas if you're really great at something that people pay you to do, you do it all the time. Anybody here read Outliers? All right, so you don't answer this, but do you know how the Beatles got to be the Beatles? The Beatles started playing in Berlin. That's, I know it's, it's kind of an awkward story to tell in front of the camera, but what happened in Berlin, there was a thriving sex industry. And in that era, somebody wanted to make it a bit more than just sex, and he said, let's go bring some rock bands. They weren't rock bands, they are just music guys. And they found some music guys in London, in Liverpool, and they brought them over from London and Liverpool to play in those sex places. Odd as it may sound, these guys actually got in at 8 o'clock in the morning and they played almost 24 hours till they sort of ran out of beer. And they got, they got paid to play, not a lot. They got paid in drinks, a bit of money. The rest you can finish up. And it was sort of an ongoing thing. And the Beatles went on and they played as long as they were awake. They actually played 17, 18 hours a day, months on end. Mo and when you play and they pay you to do what you're passionate about, they thought this was a great gig because they would otherwise play in Liverpool and have to pay for the beer. Here they at least got the beer for free. And they just went on and on and on and on. And before you knew it, the Beatles were the first band who ever got to play 10,000 hours. And when you get to play 10,000 hours, you get to be really good. You get to be so good that you can actually go and play an hour of your best hits. You can go and play on national television for one song. And you can pick one song out of 10,000 hours. You've done it so many times. It's already good. And then people pay you a lot of money to do what you really like to do. And you're passionate, you're the best in the world, and it pays. Passion, best in the world economic engine. At the heart of these things, there is a question. When I went in to run this exercise, I thought I was a really good software guy. I was at SAP, the boring software company from Germany. I was running all development. I was groomed to being the next CEO. And somebody asked me a very, very nasty question. 
what are you going to do to make the world a better place by 2020? And I figured out the next seven versions of SAP will not answer that question correctly. And so I asked myself what I'm really, really, what I'm the best in the world at. And I had to admit, it wasn't writing software, because I wasn't writing software for about 15 years at that point. I was managing budget, vision. I was taking very, very big problems and breaking them into small pieces and solving the pieces and putting them back together again. I was the best integrator of component solutions into an integrated solution. When that hit me, I asked myself what I'm passionate about. And I found out that I'm passionate about two things. I grew up in Israel. I wanted to see peace in the Middle East. And I saw Al Gore, and I figured out I have to leave a planet to my kids that is sustainable in some form or fashion. Because I had a debt to my past and a debt to my future. Now, how do you solve peace in the Middle East? and climate by being a good integrator of component solutions, of technology. I had no clue. When you look at the Middle East, you actually find out something really interesting. When the barrel of oil is at $10, peace thrives. When it's at 100 you get wars. So I asked the question, how would you run a country without oil? Using the technologies we have today, off the shelf, how would you run an entire country without oil? And then I went out and I looked at every possible solution. First thing I was absolutely positively sure will be biofuels. Why? Because the Brazilians can do it. Then I realized they have infinite land and infinite water. So you may be able to run one country without oil, but you have to destroy the Amazons and you can't replicate it. I also figured out, you actually are using more energy to create the energy than the energy you're creating. Kind of strange. So I went away from that after six months of writing papers and writing papers. And writing. Remember the first stage, write a great idea? And then I was absolutely positively sure it will be hydrogen. I read every possible book about hydrogen, and then I realized it's the stupidest way to send an electron from one place to another. Think of it the following way. If you take an electron and you package it with a package called a proton, which is 2,000 times bigger and heavier, you ship it out. We don't know how, but you ship it out. Then you, last second, you strip out the proton and use the electron. It's, it's as if somebody actually created this new service where you can send an email to a, some location. They will print it out, put it in an envelope, FedEx to the person, and then type it for him right on his desk. Some people actually say that we don't know how to ship hydrogen. They know how to put it into a, an alloy, metal alloy. This is as if you actually put the FedEx envelope in a big metal box, ship the metal box, take the envelope, take it out, and then type it into a computer. Wow. Not going to work. We figured out it's going to have to be electric. Why? Because electrons, we know how to send them at the speed of light from every place to every place. And then we started looking at the problems of how would you make an electric car that would actually be desirable for consumers. Because if consumers can't get into this act, governments can't do it for them. And we figured out you have to solve two problems. One is cost and the other one is convenience. You have to make an electric car that will be cheaper than a gasoline car and that will be more convenient than a gasoline car. And when we asked people what's inconvenient about a gasoline car, they told you stopping at a gas station. What's inconvenient about an electric car, you don't get to the gas station, <laughs> right? And so we figured out we have to solve the range problem without stopping more than 50 times a year, which is what an average driver told us, once a week, roughly five minutes, roughly. And we went out and we invented a new idea, an electric car that not only charges the battery at home and at work and at home and at work and at home and at work and at home and at work, but on the esoteric drive every once in a while to the wild lands of Denmark. On the way there, instead of stopping at a gas station and charging for eight hours, which 
an average consumer told us is inconvenient. <laughs> you could switch your battery and go. You drive, you switch, you go. Drive, switch, go became an idea that we thought was kind of obvious, right? Most of the time I don't stop, but when I do, I'd like to stop for less than three minutes and keep going. The industry said is impossible. And I sat on panels, I can't tell you how many panels with how many car guys who said th that car can't exist. It's parked there, by the way, that thing that can't exist, two of them. <laughs> There's a factory that makes 45,000 of them this year, this thing that can't exist. I've learned a lesson from my president. When I wrote that plan, the first guy I showed to was a minister of a very large European country, and he said, it's a great thing that the young generation thinks about these things. And I showed it to a president of a Scandinavian country who said, great idea, not for us. And I went on and on and on. Finally, I went to the president of Israel. I showed him the plan. He took the plan and sent it out to three experts. They all came back with the same answer that the car guys had. We then met with the vice chairman of a very large car company to remain unnamed who told him, in my face, this guy is crazy. Nobody will ever build that car. By the way, if you don't do this in Israel, we'll give you discounts on hybrids <laughs> for the whole country. And President of Israel said, Shai, you're onto something. See, ideas are good if everybody says they can't be done. You're pushing the envelope. And they really validated if the incumbents are so afraid of them, they will give whole countries discounts just not to do them. You're onto something, he said. Then came a guy who's running a car company called Renault Nissan, and we were presenting to him five minutes after we got rejected by the other car, car company. And five minutes into our presentation, he stops the president and says, Mr. Perez, I read the same paper you're presenting to me. And we were waiting for, this guy's crazy, it's can't, it can't work. He said, I got your car. Really? Yeah, I got your car, I got your battery. We can make it. I'll be your best partner. President Paris looks at him and says, really? What about hybrids? <laughs> <laughs> and Carlos Ghosn looks at him and says, hybrids are like mermaids. When you want to fish, you get a woman. And when you need a woman you get a fish. <laughs> it's neither here nor there. And we went on a five-year journey of execution, of getting the car, of picking it, getting the battery, getting, building the machine that knows how to switch batteries, putting them in taxi stations in Tokyo and getting taxis to go for 100 days because the Japanese government said it can't be done. And after 100 days of Taxis going and going and going and going, 7 by 24, they said, well, 100 days is not enough. We did another 100 days, 200 days. And after 200 days of 10,000s and tens of thousands of kilometers going, they finally said it will work for taxis. <laughs> and we've had an ongoing discussion, but eventually we have a car that ends up being, in some places like Denmark, 40, 50% cheaper than the com comparable car. In some places like Israel, just 30% cheaper. It drives, it's actually a fast car. Most people who come into the car, the, the only question remaining at the end of the drive is what color? And it's going to be, I guarantee you that, within 12, 18, 24 months of opening the network, the number one selling car in Denmark. Not the number one selling strange car, the number one selling car in Denmark. And it will be within 24 or 36 months of opening in Israel, the number one selling car in Israel. And when a car going on something other than gasoline becomes the number one selling car in the country, watch the car guys sweat. Because that is change. In an industry that has not seen change in more than 100 years. The last transformation of the car industry it's called the Ford Model T. And when you combined this car with 700 windmills in the North Sea, 
two million of these cars and 700 windmills in the North Sea spell the first ever virtual oil field, which will go forever. It never stops. It relies on no CO2. It needs no oil to come out from anywhere in the world. It creates no pollution. It creates jobs, which is unique for energy. And in the process, it makes profits. Because you see, if the economic engine doesn't continue to run, you can't get to two million. You stop after two cars. It's the combination of a solution, of passion, and a great economic engine. So much so that we believe Better Place will be the biggest company on earth. And we're not ashamed of it. Because if the world is addicted to oil, much like any addiction, getting the world off its addiction should be profitable business. Then it's up to the people who got the world off its addiction to figure out what to do with the profits. What's the next addiction we will get the world off? See, that's our next tree. There will be great ideas in here that will come to the same realization. The world of clean tech is actually going through the transformation it's going because the makers of things and the makers of energy do not talk to one another. This car will be successful for a very simple reason that if you take any car that is made today in Europe, the car costs almost 10,000 euros to make. I know you don't pay that, but it costs almost 10,000 euros to make. It goes for about a half a million kilometers. In the process of going a half a million kilometers, it uses 5,000 liters of petrol, which over the next 15 years will average out to about two euros a liter, which means a car that costs 10,000 euros to make will cost 100,000 euros to run. A car that costs 10,000 euros to make will cost 100,000 euros to run. The same electric car in three, four years' time will need one, maybe two batteries and electricity to run for the rest of the same half a million kilometers, which means in three, four years' time, that car will need maybe 10,000 euros to run for the rest of its life. And when running a device of one type and another type is 10 times difference in cost, you can do the magic that we do at Better Place. You can come in and say, pay me what you would pay for gasoline. Actually, I'll give you a discount and I won't make the price go up. And I'll build the system around to make these devices as convenient to use. By the way, same thing applies to light. Gasoline cars are wasteful because they take all this energy after you refine gasoline and you move it and you shift it. And in the last second, as you burn it, 80% of the car's engine is made to cool it down. Boy, how, how dumb that idea is, right? We, we figure out sunlight that is from 100 million years ago. We pack it, we refine it, we ship it, we fight over it. And in the last second of burning it, we waste 80% of it. Science tells you this is the most e economic thing to do. Economy tells you this is the most economic thing to do. Industries will fight. You're going to fight the same thing over light bulbs, over air conditioners, over windmills, over every possible part of our society. Where energy is used, the device and the cost of using it are interchangeable. That's where business schools come into play. Figure out the right business model by which you combine the device and the consumption, put the business model together, write the paper, analyze and analyze and analyze and analyze, then go start shaking trees. At the end of the process, you will need to modify your plan many, many times. I have had 11 versions before we actually went out to get capital. When I went out to get capital, when I shook my tree, the first tree I shook was a government tree. 
I went to the president and I said, now that you like this idea and you see that we can make the car, give me the money. And he said, look, I'm not a venture capitalist. Prime Minister, I'm not a, I'm not a venture capitalist. We don't do this thing in government. And he said, here's what we do for you. You go find $200 million, because that's what the plan said, $200 million, and you find the car company that gives us the car, and you can spend your $200 million in Israel. I thought it was funny too. But that was the best advice I ever got. He said, go find $200 million. And I had to go find $200 million. And in the process, I shook probably 200 trees. I went to business people. I went to everybody who would, who would listen to me. 190 of them still think I'm nuts to this day. They didn't invest in a company that was valued probably less than a tenth of what it valued today. One guy in particular, my chairman, my first investor, owns the refineries of Israel. Now think of a guy who just bought the refineries in Israel. He's got a poster of the refineries behind him, and I come and pitch him on a plan. He says, what is this plan? I said, we're going to end oil, and we're going to start in Israel. That's a start. <laughs> He sat silently for 45 minutes, didn't say a word. And I went through the pitch and went through the pitch and went through the pitch and went through the pitch. And when he was done, he said, thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you for coming to me first so that I can sell the refineries before everybody else figures it out. <laughs> and as we went downstairs from the 24th floor of his building, we got down to the bottom, he whispered in my ear, put me down for $100 million. Want to talk about good pitches? <laughs> he actually, he lied. On that round, he put $130 million because somebody backed away from $30 million commitment at the last second. And ever since then, he put another $100 million. And he's on the line for another $100 million. Why? Not because he's a anti-oil guy. His other business that he started in parallel was oil rigs. He, he owns six oil rigs, deep sea drilling. Because he figured out what I was telling him is I got cheap kilometers. I figured out a way to sell cheap kilometers. And he said, if you can sell a kilometer cheaper than I can refine it, I want to be in your business. It's better business than mine. Don't get too emotional with the people to whom you pitch. It's okay to be emotional internally. Don't take evil money. I've said no to evil money. But at the end of the day, get them engaged in your passion. Don't choose them by their passion. And show them that your business is a business. Otherwise, you're going to get a pat on the back. And it's great that the young generation thinks about these things. When it comes... And I'll try and close with it. When it comes to looking at it from a broader perspective, I'll try and close with that. When it comes to a broader perspective, we, got, we talked about uh, um, a question in, in prep, competitiveness of, nat of nations. And I was asked, how come Israel today is probably one of the top three countries where you would want to start a new innovative business? What sets Israel apart? from the rest of the world. And the, the unique difference of Israel is that the cultural setting in the country is a country that has the desire to win and the willingness to lose. You don't ask people to stay in the middle of a Gaussian curve. You ask people to take risks and spread the Gaussian curve as far apart as you can. Few people will be on the successful side of the Gaussian curve. For you, it's here. The few people that are on the successful side of the Gaussian curve, when they succeed, they pull the economy. They pull people with them. They pull the aspirations of the next generation behind them. They show them that success is not evil. 
does not need to happen on the backs of people. It can actually pull society forward. And the few that fail, and they do, and I started my story to you on my biggest failure. I got kicked out of Apple, which was the reason I went to Silicon Valley. But the few who fail learn a lesson and apply those lessons back. And the distance between the left side of the Gaussian curve and the right side of the Gaussian curve, much like on any planet, is actually nothing. The distance between success and failure is this tiny. The furthest place from failure is not success, it's mediocre. It's staying in the middle. If you're not willing to fail, you will build a society that will never succeed. And you have to bring that into consideration when entrepreneurs come on the line. The first assumption you make, much like venture capitalists do, is that the outcome from this venture is not money, is not success. It's great learning, which you will apply in your next business. And if you're not in it to do the next one, if you're not in it to climb the tree, don't shake a tree. Thank you. Can I get water? Well, well, thank you very much for a very inspirational talk. Um, you actually made me slightly nervous. Um, ah. Because uh, you said that you shouldn't do things that you're not great at. And um, <laughs> to, to be honest, I don't do interview. Uh, my uh, my day-to-day -day job is... I don't is do interviews either, so... I'll <laughs> my day-to-day -day job is, um, is trying to manage entrepreneurship policy in, in this country. But I am very passionate about entrepreneurship, so hopefully it will, will be okay. Okay. Uh, my, my first question. I mean, why Denmark? I mean, why is a better place in Denmark? Um, I think Israel and Denmark share a lot of things and are both, um, to, to a certain degree, extremes. We joke that uh, if you can succeed with better place in Israel, you will succeed everywhere in the world because it's the most chaotic nation in the world. I think Denmark is the most organized nation in the world. <laughs> I'll give you the example, the, the difference between uh, my meeting with the government in Israel and my meeting with the government in Denmark is, is, is perfect. So um, in Israel, I came in and the prime minister said, let's go do it, right? First, my first two weeks, actually, the president took me to every single person in government, and every day I had two meetings, and then finally the prime minister said, we'll do it. We're still struggling with regulation five years later on every single topic, right? And government changed, and even people changed their opinion within Israel, but we still do it. We still push through. I, I'm struggling getting a permit to dig a hole in the ground. My average time to dig a hole in the ground is 11 months. It takes us a week to fill it with a machine. Mm -hmm. but 11 months to get the hole into the ground. In Denmark, we came in, the first meeting we had with uh, government, somebody brought in 13 offices, thir 13 branches of government. We were sitting in front of a person, and he said, okay, Ministry of Finance, do you have questions? And he asked me the questions, I answered. Nobody was, you know, it was good back and forth. Ministry of Energy, back and forth, climate. And we went through all two and a half hour meeting, question, all orderly. Eventually, Prime Minister office looked around, said, everybody okay? Everybody said yes. Said, oh, we approve it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you're kidding me, right? That's not just the introductory meeting. No, no, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> and it was amazing. We, the guys build a battery switch station in Denmark, I think a month and a half shorter time than it takes us to build it in Israel. And that's not even counting the permit cycle, which is probably about 10 months shorter. Now, you get those two extremes and you sort of learn that every, every other place in the world will be in between. Yeah. We did Israel because it was a unique yeah. island. Denmark has the uniqueness of being three islands effectively connected, so it's easier to put a network in between. You don't need to connect every spot to every spot, you just need to get to the bridge. Um, and there's an awareness, an incredible awareness. There's an amount of wind power at night 
that is unparalleled anywhere else in the world. Yet Denmark wants to go to 50% wind power. It better have two million cars to take the. Yeah, the, the way uh, don't have any. <laughs> otherwise, <to> <laughs> nobody, nobody watches TV in the middle of the night. Yeah, I've been and, trying to do laundry. But and it, and yeah. if you do, if you do watch TV in the middle of the night, nobody likes the TV to go on off as wind <laughs> goes on, right? So you need something that sits there and says, whenever you got it, bring it on, right? And that's Only, where we got the cars. Only cars. Yeah. Can I it, drink directly from that? Is that legitimate? Sure. All right. I don't know. If it's it's a retap or something. I know. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. I actually think that um, sort of have this uh, chaotic thing and really structure is also very much about the entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, sometimes you really need to be chaotic and other times you really need to be structured. One of the things that, that strikes me with, with Better Place is sort of how you build partnerships. I mean, could you elaborate a bit on that? Because it's very different. I mean, in the old days, if you build a company, you would like to have an important Total asset control. within the company. Right. I mean, you would own the cars within you because otherwise you would be afraid of supply chain and all right. that. I mean, how do you view partnership? We, that was one of the biggest debates we've had in, in Better Place. And I can tell you, we've changed our mind on that numerous, numerous times. We, we obviously ha would have had an easier time going out and controlling that aspect of the, the plan, building our own car, right? And to a certain degree, what Tesla has done, been a great precursor and we, we you know, the, built a fantastic car. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, we also realized that you don't solve the, the problem that we wanted, which is to run a country without oil and then eventually run the world without oil by building our own car. That would lead to you know, a company that is limiting itself by its ability to scale and grow. You go to a car company like Renault because they, they answer the following question in the following way. I, I sat down with their chief executive, Patrick Pelata, and we were arguing demand supply equations and I kept telling him, you got to understand, when they started, they thought this car will sell 2,500 cars a year. And we argued and argued and argued. Finally, he said, gentlemen, he needs a lot more cars than 2,500 <laughs> cars a year. And I said, you see, I told you. He said, don't worry about it. We know how to scale. And I said, how long does it take you to, to do 10x? Or how, how long would it take you to go from 45,000 cars to 450,000 cars? He said, give me 18 months. I said, all right, what's the next 10x? So four and a half million cars, another 18 months. When you realize that you're dealing with players who can build an infrastructure on one hand and can build a car on the other hand, and they don't have to be the same company because one is an expert in making cars. But if you let Renault build the network that Johnny's building, yeah, that will it will never be done. Yep. And if you let us build a car that knows how to go through 15 years, you know, crash tests and no recalls and everything else, we will never build that car. And you know you got to know what is critical and what needs to be shopped out to the people who are better at it. Which is also, which is a new model, I mean, for, for many business. This sort of, you, I think one of the things you s mentioned a few times is that you change plans quite often. I mean, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, are taught that, well, you should have your business plan and you should stick to your plan. I mean, I think it's getting more and more common saying that, well, I mean, you need to get to plan B quickly no, or you plan C or D. You shouldn't automatically go to plan B. You should, you should argue plan A all the time, right? So what you need to do is sit there and say, okay, what have we learned over the last six months? What's right? What's wrong? We thought originally we will need to put chart spots in the streets. We thought lots of chart spots at Starbucks. <laughs> and then we realized nobody drives an hour to a Starbucks and then parks for six hours, nah. right? If you're going to spend six hours at Starbucks, it's because you don't have a car. <laughs> yeah. So that dropped off. And then we realized the place you actually do need chart spots is soccer fields, right? Yeah. Right, because you do go there for a long, uh, Danish team, Portugal, right? You, everybody goes, yeah. you, you spend three hours there, you come out, it takes you another hour just to find yeah, your you car because you're drunk. Drive right? Afterwards, yeah, probably right? should drive afterwards, yeah. Right? But you spend three hours, you're, you're going away for, it's not your nearest neighborhood. That's where you put chart spots. Now, you start asking, how many of those do I need? It ends up that you need cultural places. Soccer on one hand, the symphony on the other hand, movie theaters. But you don't go to the supermarket too far away. You don't, but it, it, so it boils down to, I need chart spot at home and a chart spot at work, and that covers it. Then you start looking at the plan. So where, what would I do with the other 190,000 chart spots? You say, well, that was a stupid idea. You take it off, yeah. right? Now, we argue all the time. Should I do fixed battery cars or switchable battery cars? Should we support it? Shouldn't we support it? What about range extenders? Do we, uh, we argue all the time. It's legitimate. 
but you have to end up on not an emotional connectedness to your previous argument, but the willingness to accept if market changes. You change. Are, are, you change as long as it makes sense. Yeah. We, we have this argument, you're sitting with an iPad here, right? Um, and we have this argument that the car guys are, are all doing fixed battery cars, and only one company did a switchable battery car. Um, and we, we keep coming to the same thing. There probably have been 40 tablets introduced in the last three months. Yeah. I can still argue with you. A year from now, 95% of the tablets we'll sold will be iPads. Yep. <laughs> so do you look at the masses and you say, I'm going to shift my plan to support the masses? Or do you look at your plan and say, is it still valid given that the other 39 are coming out with something that is a bit different? Do I just support it? Do I change my plan? And if you can't find a good enough reason to change your plan, don't shift with the wind. Right? You, you're, unless you're a windmill, you're not supposed to shift with the wind. If you have a plan, it's a solid plan. You have to validate it, be open-minded, stick to execution, and then every six months come back reevaluate. Talk, talk about evalu evaluating your plan. I mean, one of the things that most entrepreneurs that, that we meet in, in some of our programs sort of misses, as I see it, is that they never talk to the customers. I mean, how, how are, have, you, have you been involved with, with your customers in, in developing the better place? We don't. You don't? Steve Jobs said it fantastically. If I ask customers about building a tablet, no, they say no, yeah. They, uh, they, mm -hmm. all they'll tell you is, yeah, you know, this is, it's not going to work, right? Because they all said the same thing about the iPhone. They said the same thing about the iPad. If we go to customers and we ask them, would you like to do a switchable battery car? They'll give you all the reasons why not. If you told them, would you like an electric car? You ask the wrong questions, you're going to get the wrong answers. Of course. Every, every questionnaire that I've seen going to customers asks, how much more would you pay to drive an electric car? And the funny part about it is analysts come back to us and say, you see, there's only demand for like 27% of the population who will pay 5,000 euros or more for an electric car. And I look at them and I say, you, you idiots. First, there's demand for 27% of people who will pay 5,000 euros or more for an electric car. That's an immense amount of demand. <laughs> Second thing is, did you ask him how many people will pay less to drive an electric car? No, but you can't build that. I said, but did you ask him? Yeah, I said no. <laughs> you can't build that. I said, you ask him first. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll build it later, right? And when they ask it, 89% say, yeah, of course, I'll, t I'll pay less to drive an electric car. If I, if I can pay less and not kill my kids, I'll, I'll do that, sure. right? <laughs> now, don't ask the stupid questions, and you won't get the stupid answers. Now, what you need to do is put a product in front of them. Put an iPad in front of people. Yep. Let them come into the Apple store. Then ask them, what do you like or not like about it? Then build version 2. Then version 3. Then version 4. And every time, make it better. I stand in the visitor center. You should come to the visitor mm -hmm. center. How many people here have been to the visitor center in Copenhagen? Mm -hmm. That's your crowd. Johnny, it's, these are your guys. <laughs> Send your friends. Mm -hmm. um, I stand in the visitor center. In, in Tel Aviv, I probably do it every week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting down in a, in a panel with a guy from VW in Germany. We had a public fight on panel. And we're going back and forth on economics, on CO2, on everything. And then finally, he, when he couldn't find the answer, he said, Mr. Agassi here, he comes from the software industry. He thinks a car is just a thing to get you from point A to point B. We sell emotional connectedness. We sell an emotional cell. And he doesn't understand it, like VW cars, emotional cells. Yeah. People like the sound of the vroom vroom in the engine. <laughs> so I said, you know, I got to tell you a story. And this is a true story. I was standing in, in, in our visitor center in Tel Aviv, and there's this lady that runs around, makes a ton of commotion, very small. And she's pulling people in, and she's signing people up. And so I was looking, looking, and finally I came. She comes out, and I say, did you buy a car? I bought two. I said, thank you. He said, no, 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 Mr. Agassi, thank you. I'm going to make every single person in this country buy your cars. I said, then I really need to thank you. He said, no, no, then I thank you. He <laughs> says, look, I got a three-year-old child. He's got asthma. If everybody in Israel buys your car, my son lives. If not, I'm not sure. Thank you. I said, that's an emotional sell. That's, yeah. <laughs> 
Talking, now, about, the, uh, talking about emotion, I've read somewhere actually that, that you um, convinced your father to buy you an apple at a very early age and you promised him 10% of, of uh, your earning on computer programs. I was it, a better programmer than a businessman. Yeah, is that true? <laughs> Ah, it's true. Yeah, because I mean, I, I actually paid him fifty percent. Okay, fifteen. That, that's good. I learned a lot from that because I, I financed my my daughter's uh, venture. She was doing ice cream uh, for free. I mean, next time. She, oh, don't don't ever give her anything no, no, for no. free. No, no, no. I, I know that idea. now. So I I learned a lot from that. Uh, but uh, t talking about, I mean, you talked about a story how how you got some capital, but I mean, venture capital is normally known high returns, sort of slightly very high risk, but still, I mean, this is a completely new industry where you have to, I mean, as you said, you have to create it yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you, was it the same thing with your father that you just convinced them? Or, I mean, what, what could they see that this was something really big that you were onto? Look, we're, we're coming in with, um, with the digitization yeah. of an industry that today spends $2 trillion a year People buy two trillion dollars a year worth of kilometers. Credit cards, seven euros a time, but two trillion in the aggregate. And it's the last massive industry that has not digitized. Right? We've digitized lighting, we've digitized cooling, we've digitized, almost digitized, you know, food, no. <laughs> every, everything. Nothing else, yeah. Music, email, books, everything has been digitized. And all of a sudden, there's a two trillion dollar shift and somebody comes to you and says, I know how to make that $2 trillion. My cost, long term, 10%. And you look at it and you say, well, prove it to me. And we've gone through nine months of prove it to me, prove it to me. Prove. And finally, they say, look, everything he says sounds right. X, you know, bottoms out into, now it's not that there are no risks, there's a ton of risks, but the, the foundation is, is solid. And that combined with my past experience, I think that, no disrespect, but being an entrepreneur here with no management background would not, even if you had the same idea and I gave you the same paper, you wouldn't be able to raise $200 million. No. Now, I came in from a position of fantastic experience. I was an entrepreneur who sold his business twice. I went into a large company. My budget, my, my annual budget of development at SAP was about a billion euro a year. I managed 13, 14,000 engineers in 50 labs around the world. And I was willing to give it up, go back to, to employee one, yeah. right? Yeah. And in doing so, I, I created a perception, if you want. I'm not sure if it was reality at the time, but a perception of one, I truly believed in it, right? I was willing to put on a line, something that most people wouldn't, a career. The second thing is, People said, this guy, if I gave him $200 million to run over the next three years, that's about a tenth of his budget. Yeah, he's done it before. He knows, <laughs> he knows how to manage it, yeah. right? And if he needs, you know, today we're 700 people in the company. If he can manage 14,000 people, he'll manage 700 people. Yeah. So I got the, the sort of the com combined factor of being an entrepreneur and being a, a sort of a big corporate manager. And that's a unique position, which I'm using to do something really meaningful. I think people here, that's why I said, plan to shake the tree, and every time go shake a bigger tree until it you find your question. You, yeah. right. Actually, it's, to be honest, I promised two things when I uh, said yes. One would be to bring the venture cop, cop to the <laughs> stage, and, and the second one would be at some point stop asking questions and ask so that the floor so they will also have a chance. So I think, should we open for for question? Any sure. great questions? Other with you. Hello. Thank you for a good presentation. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what is the biggest challenge you have ahead for a better place right now? You so buying cars. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were going through five stages of, of risks. And the f first risk was a concept risk, was what I described to you, was people buying into the concept. And it manifested in getting governments on board, getting car companies on board, getting investors on board. And I think we've, by and large, gone through the concept proof phase when you can drive a car and you can go switch a battery. Most people have a harder time arguing that the concept is not going to work. We now are in the final stages of what we call the solution risk, right? We had 
internally almost a thousand engineers between Better Place and our contractors, and at Renault about two thousand engineers working on a combined solution that needs to function seamlessly. It's not enough that we can switch a battery 99% of the time, because that would mean every hundredth switch we would have a person stuck in a station. It has to be 99.9999999999, right? So that it's seamless. And all that is work that is being done right now. We're testing and driving and testing and driving and testing. And, and the longer we go, the, the better it gets, right? The third risk was demand risk, right? You can build a great solution, but as HP has proven, if you build it, not always do they come, right? And so we've gone through um, a phase in which we talked about it. Now we're going through a phase in which people actually touch the product and the thousands of people that come to the visitor center, we get a percentage of people who actually decide to go buy the car and we try and grow that percentage and prove that the solution is in high demand. Then it's execution. Delivering thousands of cars a year translates it eventually to delivering 20 cars every day, right? So it's 20 cars delivered, it's 40 charge spots installed, it's 40 calls on a call center that gets called on, you know, it's my first charge, the light is blinking blue, is that normal? It, it's a lot of execution and it boils down to 500 processes that we have mapped inside the organization that each one of them needs to work in order for this company to work, which is an astonishing high number for a small startup. Um, if you think about what we're doing, we're, we're a company that doesn't move a mountain. We're moving multiple mountains at the same time, right? We're moving solutions and demand and market and branding and everything else. After execution will come scaling. Just so you understand, this, this year um, we're installing 80 switch stations, roughly, um, in Israel and Denmark and a couple more in other places in the world. 2012, we'll probably need to install about 250 switch stations. 2013, we'll probably need to install about 1,000 to 1,500 switch stations. By 2015, it would be an astonishing number for you, but our target is we're going to buy and sell stuff at an order of about $10 billion. Scale goes really fast when you're doing electric kilometers because people drive. And when you shift $2 trillion, which we believe will shift within a decade from liquid molecules to electrons, $2 trillion worth of new industries are created. Right? Old die, new begins. And in that process, scale is just scary. But it happens. And somehow, I guarantee you, 10 years from now, somebody will look back and say, it's sort of obvious, they didn't do anything. <laughs> right? But that's when we succeed. We, we all talk about the fact that our goal, my goal is that when my youngest son, who's 11 years old, gets to be a businessman, he tells me, Dad, I don't want to work at Better Place. It's a boring company. Right? That's when we have succeeded. Um, you mentioned at one point uh, how you made sure you avoided evil money. Yes. Uh, I'd like you to talk a bit more about how you identified and defined that in your search for the 200 million. Um, I'm not sure I want to be on the record on that. Well, you have to name names, but but really, what were the mm. what were these? I think, the, I think what were the values or the the analysis models you used to to, to kind of I, I keep think your yeah. own values in, in line? I, I think eventually you have to pick money that doesn't come at the expense of the people. So, it's okay to bring in oil money. It's not okay to bring in oppression money, if you think about it that way. It's it's okay to work with people who support. Um, civil rights, it's not okay to work with people who do not recognize civil rights. And I think that's my line, um, much like I wouldn't take um, diamond money if, you know, if I was in, you know, blood diamonds, if I was in the diamond industry, and, uh, and I wouldn't take money from a company that wants to kill this innovation just because it will help them. Um, I also wouldn't take money that comes from uh, people who, who's, whose money is tainted in ways that do not support our values, right? It, there's a difference between taking money from um, Idan Ofer, who's, who's a uh, um, oil businessman as part of his business, um, and our great partner here in Denmark, Dong Energy, which one would say, you know, on the one hand they pollute, and on the other hand they're, uh, they're helping clean up. Because if you talk to Anders Eldrop, he tells you 
you're part of my way of changing the inheritance of an 80% fossil fuel company that I inherited into a zero carbon company that I will leave. And if that's what he's doing, I admire his, um, his partnership because he's actually willing to, to make change knowing that change is not let's destroy the oil and build everything from scratch. Change is let's provide a car and not ask everybody to give up their cars. Right? Sustainability is not about asking people to give up everything they do today. Sustainability is giving people what they want to do but changing the way it's done. And that's the difference I see, that's the line where, where at least in my mind, you can, you can have your own line. Thanks. Thank you for a very <coughs> interesting um, presentation. I have two short questions. Uh, here in Denmark, cars are very expensive. And unfortunately, because of the extra taxes and, and stuff that the Danish government puts on them, it looks like electric cars are gonna be more expensive than gas-driven cars. And the last government didn't want to extend the subsidy beyond 2012, which means it'd be impossible for you to sell the, the two million cars. We now have a new government, and I don't know exactly how they stand. The, the other question has to do with the wind energy. You're correct that there's a lot of windmills here, but they're in the west of Denmark. Most people live in the east of Denmark, and without a smart grid, we have no way of getting the clean energy to where the people actually live. Could you address these two questions? All right, so let me address both these. The, some of them include some myths, and I want to bust the myths. One, the tax benefits are actually until 2015, not 2012, and I think that's important to understand. I think that um, eventually electric cars need to succeed without any subsidies, but you have to recognize that we're working in an industry where uh, we will have you know, nor a bit north of 10,000 cars produced of this car in the first year, competing against an industry that goes 70 million cars. So we have a volume disadvantage, and we need a bit of help from governments, and, and the number is until we get to about 2%, 3% of the population. It shouldn't go beyond that. When, when a country gets to 2% electric, 3% electric, they should remove all benefits and do whatever they want to do. Um, so my view is that we've, if we get to 2% of the population by 2015, subsidies can be taken off, and then whoever was early on a, a buyer should, should enjoy the fact that they went early on. Um, also on the myth that this is an expensive car, the Fluence diesel 1.5 liter, so the same body, same length, actually a bit shorter length, and about 60% of the power, so for those who want to drive a fast car, Fluence diesel is about 370,000 krona. This car is 205,000 krona on electric. It's 50% faster. Um, it doesn't make voom voom, but it can make any sound you want. <laughs> so that's, that's the reality of where we are. By, by the way, that holds true almost in any country around the world. So if you, if you look at that car, it's, it's better than the Camry. In the US, it will cost, with today's incentives, less than the Corolla. So it's not a unique thing for Denmark, even though in Denmark it's, it's an exceptional distance, but we see it everywhere around the world. The incentives in, Par in, in Paris, in Madrid, in London, and in Copenhagen get you to almost the same uh, range of, uh, of a delta between, uh, in favor of an electric car. Um, on windmills, I think that um, what you need is a connected grid, not necessarily a smart grid. Right? So what we have done and everybody m makes that mistake. They think that you need to balance between the car and the household and every appliance inside the ho household, which is where a lot of the smart grid investment and effort goes to. And I'm not, say I'm not against it. If you want to have a smart meter that goes into every single detail of the, of the household and enables you to turn off individual appliances based on load, by all means, go do it. But if you look at where the biggest load will come. And I'm, there's no way to stop it. It will just come. It will come from electric cars. So there's a new load that comes in. That load comes if you don't do anything at two spikes, one at 8.30 in the morning, and the other one at 5.30 in the afternoon. And those two spikes are going to be so big, they actually, if you do not manage them, they will add 50% demand on the grid on those two spikes for about two hours each. And the rest of the 20 hours, you'll sit with not only excess capacity on distribution and generation, you'll sit with a very idle grid for, for a, a bulk of the time. To actually make electric cars um, 
spike the grid would, actually, would, would make the grid worse than it is today. <coughs> what we've done is we put software in the car that does something very, very intelligent and yet very simple. All these cars communicate with our grid and tell us what their priority of charging is at this moment in time. <coughs> in other words, when a car parked in a parking lot here, if it's a professor who comes in every morning and leaves in the late in the afternoon and their car has just driven 20%, 25% of their battery, the car will send a signal saying, I'm a low priority, I'm a 2 out of 10. Whereas if Johnny's coming over from his home and he, it's the first time he's, you know, he's at this parking lot and they say this is probably an anomaly so he's going to be leaving in about an hour and his battery is only at 25% usage, he would get a 7 out of 10. The grid tells the building, how many cars can you charge? And our system just sorts them out. And with that, we've pushed the power back into the utility. By doing so, we can use as much power as coming into the grid. Every minute, every second, we can switch up or down on this list. You don't need more than that. That's the, that's the balancing supply demand that will make the grid take more windmills at any point during the day, in particular in the night. And that's the cheapest upgrade to the grid because it costs nothing. Do, do we have time for one more or should we... Did I to talk too much? We have one last question. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that one of the first key points to build a successful business is actually your passion. So my question is, how do you actually find out where your passion is? Because we are distracted by so many things, you know. So it's, I think that it's difficult to you know, find your own way You see, okay, this is the thing I want to do. So what's your piece of advice? I, I don't know how to solve that. Um, I think you're right. I think that's... Look, let me tell you this thing. What I, the advice I gave you, even though it's very simple, passion, best in the world at an, an economic engine, it's probably one of the hardest exercises you will go through with yourself. It took me the better part of six months just to find the answers to the three questions, not to find the heart, the core. But eventually you know what you're passionate about. If you don't know what you're passionate about, you have a deeper problem, right? And it has to be some... Don't be ashamed of admitting to what it is. Usually we're passionate about something, but we're ashamed to admit it because society tells us you cannot be passionate about this. Zuckerberg was passionate about getting a date. I kid you not. And then he was passionate about writing platforms and code. Those were his two passions. One, he wouldn't admit. If you've seen the movie, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Now, he was very passionate about writing great code. And he combined those two passions into building something very unique. Now, I'm not sure how much the world is better because of Facebook, but he did build something very, very unique. Jobs' passion was about making this device. He called it magic. He wanted to build it all his life. This one device. And he worked toward it. It was in his mind. And he, keep, he kept saying the same thing. You asked me about, do you do research with people? Jobs said, products are there before I created them. They're there, I just manifest them. Right? It's Michelangelo's thing of, you know, the statue was in the stone. I just got it out. If you're not passionate about something, there is no there. There's nothing that you can manifest. You have to find it inside you. And ask yourself the questions. What makes you tick? Go back to the moments where you're the most elated with something that you've done. Whether it's a trip somewhere, whether it's listening to music, something that has made you feel, boy, I wish I did that every day. Because if you do something that you say, I wish I did that every day, and you do that every day, you're happy. And if you're happy, you're going to be successful at it. Thank you. I think that is actually the, the perfect way to end it. I also want to thank you for taking the time to actually do this. I'm responsible for introducing entrepreneurship policy, also entrepreneurship education in Denmark. And it's extremely important that, that people like you sort of put a face to what is success and what, it, what can you actually achieve if you take this serious. So thank you very much thank for, you. for thank coming you for inviting and taking me. the thank time. You thank you all. Do I stay here? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anders. Um, Shai, you just stay put. They told me not to get off stage. Exactly, exactly. You're here for the full ride. Um, so, I would like all of you to find your phone. Why? Because what we're doing now is the coaching sessions. So, if anyone didn't catch it before, what VentureCup does is competitions. We brought to our alumni, uh, Energy, winner of VentureCorp Ideas Competition within the clean tech category. Um, they do a, a solar thermal roofing solution. And we have Edgeflow, who is the, in the run-up of Nordic Clean Tech Open. Um, and they do wind turbines at rooftops as well. They will come up here. They'll do a three minutes pitch then Shai, hopefully, will learn them how to shake that tree, <laughs> um, catch uh, a VC or two, and then, once that's over, next team will come up, pitch three minutes, given more uh, feedback, just five minutes, and once this is over, then it's your turn. Then we need you to do an SMS voting. Um, these are the details. So if you believe that the best investor pitch was from Energy Team 1, you write an SMS to 1234 Team A. If you believe, on the other hand, that Edgeflow is the best in Vetra Pitch and that they should win the private session, 20 minutes with Shai alone, just afterwards here, then, of course, you should write Team B. These informations will be shown again after the pitches. So, um, Team 1, please, Energy, come join us. I have the pleasure of doing energy in three minutes. My name is uh, Lars Peterson and I'm uh, acting CEO of energy. And uh, what is energy? Energy is a new aesthetically solar roof that will actually cover the, actu uh, the annual spend of heat and power in a regular household. And we do that by combining three innovations, the absorber itself, a new heat to power module, and a new uh, control and forecasting system that's going to optimize the system so that it predicts itself whether it should harvest energy, store it, or convert it to energy and put it back into the grid. Of course, this also makes us able to uh, fuel the future better, <laughs> better place cars. The market that we are going to uh, target with this, by 2018, we think that this is going to be uh, huge. We're going to break the 1 billion crown mark and sell more than 5,000 roofs across Europe. That gives us the staggering market share of 0.2%. So we're overly ambitious in terms of market share. And the ones that are going to um, have the benefit, the user, what, what we offer them, is that they get an economic roof. You, know, you don't have to pay for extra solar absorbers, photovoltaics modules. It's in your roof. And it doesn't cost more than a standard roof. And it will save you. Uh, 900 crowns a month from the day you install it. We save a lot of the environment. No more double roofs. Only one roof covers everything, one installation. And the last thing, we want to make it as practical as possible for users not to uh, be interrupted by the technology in their house, but the technology adapting to them. That means there's still power in the sockets, there's still heat in the radiators or floors. And the team doing so is a mix of uh, noobs, like myself, or we have Christian being our uh, technology wizard, the inventor, founder, and Yen, who is protecting all our good ideas in terms of patents. I think we just filed second patent. 
And uh, of course, we're teaming up with a lot of great companies also to, uh, to realize this. So, energy in three minutes. Thank you. I wasn't told what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Can we do it after we see both presentations? Or you want to do it now? Yeah. Sit down. It's okay. Yeah. Stay. It's okay. Stay. Pom pom pom. Ooh, <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> well, why? Well, thank you. I need that one as well. Well, um, my name is uh, Jacob Anderson. I am the CEO of a company called Edgeflow, and um, Edgeflow develops and produces a special kind of roof-mounted wind turbine, as has been said earlier in the presentations today. Um, before I tell you too much about what it is we do, I'd like to tell you a bit about why we actually do it. Because Edgeflow has, from the get-go, been founded on the basis of a close dialogue with these large energy-consuming companies. Um, and what we found in uh, discussing uh, the environment with these companies was that they are actually pretty committed to doing investments into the environment and uh, sort of investing green. The thing is that along the way, they sort of ran out of uh, good options for investing. When you have the light bulbs, when you have the good pumps and things like that, you sort of run out of things that are both green and financially viable. And that's where Edgeflow comes in. Because we have this wind turbine that actually does both. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, of course, when you have a wind, re wind turbine, you need to have a wind resource. And what we found was that as the wind hits big box-shaped buildings, which is Incidentally, the kind of buildings that our clients are situated in, as it hits these buildings, it accelerates. And right there, right there at the roof's edge, you see an accelerated flow. So essentially, you have like an energy concentration right there at the roof edge. So that's the one thing, the resource. The second thing we need, of course, is something for tapping into that resource. And the second thing, of course, is our wind turbine. And it might look very exotic, but actually, the whole idea with this wind turbine is that it's all very, very simple and standardized. Everything in this, this turbine is uh, standard materials, standard components, standard technology. And by having that focus, by I think you're, the, the term is keeping it simple, stupid, by doing that, we actually uh, cut the cost of a system like this uh, by almost half. And of course, that does wonders for our business uh, case. So what does it add up to? Well, we know that we can realize a payback of less than five years on this wind turbine installation on, of course, the, the correct siding, the correct uh, uh, building. And uh, also, at the same time, we uh, create significant savings on CO2 and other emissions. And, of course, that's something that resonates very clearly with our customers. I didn't have time to clear their names uh, with, for this presentation, so I'm sorry, I don't have any of them up there uh, here. But um, I can tell you that a lot of international companies are very interested in this technology and in this prospect. And, of course, we don't, uh, don't only look at the Danish market, we see a great potential in, for instance, the UK and the US markets. So uh, I guess that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you. So thank you very much for your time. Do we need an extra chair? <laughs> so I'll just stand here to the side. So and feedback <laughs> to both of you. Um, you're going to need to go away from the model um, where you sell a device. And you need to get into a model where uh, you sell kilowatt hours. Because that's what you're really giving people. Right? You're giving them kilowatt hours. You're giving them clean kilowatt hours, but in you, at the end of the day, you're giving them kilowatt hours. And, you, and you're both extremely lucky that you're doing this here in, uh, in Denmark at this point in time. You can stand if you want to. You, I, I think you, I'll just stand, actually. Um, or, um, you, you're both lucky you're doing it in, in Denmark because you're competing not with the generation cost at the station, but with the cost of consumption at the household, which is significantly higher. And so 
selling a device is actually a mistake for both of you. What you need to find is a partner who is able to finance devices and sell kilowatt hours. It's usually called a utility. And it's people who have a very low cost of capital. They pay 3%, 4% of their money at, on the worst cases. In some cases, they pay 1% or 2% because the government helps them. And then they sell today you know, 22, 30 cent kilowatt hours. You guys can beat 22 cents kilowatt hours in a heartbeat. Um, in both of your cases, you're going to see that you're going to go away from issues that are related to science or related to technology. Right? Today, that's sort of what worries you. Tomorrow, what will worry you is financing. So go find a great financier, somebody who knows how to raise debt, somebody who knows how to package revenues and sell that um, in the market. I know it sounds strange, but you need financial engineers more so than you need technology engineers right now. And you're going to need to worry very, very much about installation costs. It's the stuff you don't worry about too much right now. And it's if there's something you need to, to go find are true hands-on blue-collar people who figure out tricks to make your stuff installable at the cheapest price. Last thing I would do if I were the two of you, I would sign an agreement here in one of the rooms of, and become partners. <laughs> you complement each other in such a great way. You both go on the roof. You, um, one, you, if there's sun, there's no wind. If there's wind, there's no sun. I would go in the back room and sign a landmark deal between <laughs> And share the prize winning. You would be the mediator. Yeah. I, I, and if, if I were you, I, I would also immediately agree that whoever wins gets to invite the other one to the one-on-one -on -one meeting. So that both of you get to be in, in the one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, last thing you got to remember is the following thing, and that's where it comes to science. Um, you identify very nicely that wind gets sort of an amplifier on the edge of a building, and it's a fantastic idea. I like that idea a lot. But you also have to remember that uh, wind is a derivative of sun, right? So overall worldwide, I know it doesn't feel like that in Denmark, but it, um, and most people don't understand that science, but the reality is wind is, is a differential of, uh, of sun power in the form of heat. So when the sun moves around, when the planet rotates and the sun hits different surfaces, you get so solar thermal differentiation as a result of that you get wind moved in the other direction mm -hmm. and as a result of that um, we get 800 um, terawatts worth of solar power to hit the planet at any point in time but a derivative of that in wind so there's a lot less energy a lot less power in wind than there is in in solar and so eventually solar wins right on science not today, but eventually solar winds. It's not always um, today's solution cost-wise, but um, if, if you look at the, sort of the, the future, it's bound to be solar roofs. At the end of the day, you cannot not put solar on every roof, right? And that's, that's gonna be a, whether it's from you or somebody else, every roof will be a solar panel everywhere around the world. I'm not sure every roof will be a windmill. Right? I wouldn't recommend it, though. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend putting a windmill up uh, on, on every, every roof. roof right. So, it's not so we, we, we have to remember that, and that's the reason is, again, that power differential. It's, it's skewed so, so much in favor of, uh, of the sun versus, uh, versus its first derivative, uh, wind. And you, the next derivative is, is wave, and we've seen a lot of people go after wave energy, and that's sort of a derivative of wind. So you get one more decrease, another order of magnitude decrease in the available power you have in the world. So that's, that's the only advice I would give you. But seriously, you guys should sign, uh, find a way to either sign an agreement or merge <laughs> and, and go at it together. Because if you can do both, it'll be much more differentiated than anything you can do on your own. Okay? Thank you very much. Now you vote. Hope I didn't ruin your competition by saying both of them are good. Perfect. Yeah, everything is working. That's cool. So thank you again, um, everybody. Just uh, wait a second. We'll announce the winner in a 
in a minute or two. Um, my name is Michael. I come from Venture Cup as well. I'm the uh, CEO. Uh, thank you, everybody here, for joining us as well. I just want to say that for your, those of you who haven't voted yet, you have just one or two minutes left. Again, Team A for energy and Team B for edge flow over here. And you have to SMS <laughs> to um, 1231, I think it was. It's 1231 if you haven't done this already. So I've been asked to, uh, to spend those two minutes trying to say something. I've been trying to recap a little bit <laughs> what it was that you said here. Um, so why are we actually here? Well, Shai told us that um, the best road to success is, correct me if I'm wrong, three steps. <laughs> you said that it was about finding your passion. What is your most passionate about? It was also about finding what are you best at. What can you be best at in the world or just best at here in Copenhagen? And also getting people onto your passion as well and trying to find the economic engine. Um, as well, I think that's... Is this working? As well, I think that's really important for Denmark as well. Finding those new technologies, trying to see if we can come up with that best in the world thing. I think it's important for a country to, to come up with the... Uh, especially a, com a country like Denmark, to come up with the best technology and be first in this. I'm happy to see that we are first at all in, uh, in better place as well, that we are one of the first countries to implement this in a good way. And I, I think as well that it's important for, uh, to teach the nation that we really have to develop great entrepreneurs. It takes, you know, it takes a thousand more than a thousand entrepreneurs to just make one great company. And that's what we need to develop. We need to find those initial startups. We need to find you guys and tell them that your ideas is worth trying out. So that's why we do it at what we do at, at Venture Cup. And we are very passionate helping startups. That what we, that's what we do. That's what we are passionate about. Me, myself, I recently became a CEO of Venture Cup. That's, it's, it's a great job, but you know what I miss the most? Um, my previous job. I was a uh, regional manager of Copenhagen. I used to find the entrepreneurs. I used to talk to them. I used to go to classrooms and do presentations. It doesn't seem like that right now, but that's actually what I did. And what I miss the most is the five minutes after. You know, when you get people like yourselves come up to you and say, oh, that was actually great. I didn't know that there was a place where we could get that feedback or where we could develop our idea. And we could see the passion in your eyes. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. You, it gives me so much energy. So that's the one thing that I really miss. So actually, you missed that job quite a lot. <laughs> you should keep doing Don't it. tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Okay, so um, that's what we do at, at Venture Cup. We're a non-profit. So we try to help you guys by presenting you or presenting people with, with ideas for the right people. Like, for instance, today we have two alumni companies up here. Um, so we have a great network. We try to teach you guys to how to focus on your ideas, your value proposition, and how to pitch your idea. And we try to celebrate the entrepreneurs as well. Our next competition is, uh, has a deadline on November 28th. So if any of you guys have any ideas that you want to try out, you should definitely consider doing that there. Um, and as well, you know, today marks a great, it's only like two weeks for, uh, we do this clean tech competition every year as well. We try to find the, the best clean tech companies in Denmark. We now have two here. We're going to find some more. So we have 10 uh, clean tech companies and we're going to send the best one of those to uh, Silicon Valley actually to try to compete in, uh, compete in the world championships. Last year we found a team that that actually uh, went there and, and won the competition. Which one? Uh, it's called uh, Abeo. I deal with the uh, concrete solutions. Um, so that's what we do. Um, again, we're close to finding a winner, right? Yeah. Do we have one? Okay, so... What? Yeah, okay, cool. So, um, Shai, just let me... The right thing, uh, the last thing you said was uh, that you did, you did praise Denmark a bit. Um, but still, I think we have some way to go. I really think so. I think one of the best things that we could take away from you is you said, you know, if, if you're not willing to fail, 
then you can't build something really great. So I hope that's that's what we can take here. So the winner is, and uh, you get uh, 20 minutes with uh, Shai here, it's uh, energy. <laughs> Thank you all for voting. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you all for well voting. Done. That's fantastic. That was uh, perfect. And um, will you uh, end today's show? I can end today's show. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we will be shipping the two of you off. So you just walk down the stage into your lounge in the back. 20 minutes have not started yet, but they will soon. And I know there's journalists and press waiting to meet Shai as well. Tight schedule. And then I want to say to Edgeflow, but actually to all of you guys. So we've been uh, chasing the SMS voting and like following the stats and like we're like, okay, Edgeflow's voting the highest, they're gonna win. Oh no, wait, it's energy. Oh, it's 50-50 now. But in the end, it was energy. Um, there's uh, still for the next 10 minutes coffee. Uh, sorry, so grab a cup of coffee while you're on your way to a lecture or job. And um, thank you for today. <laughs>